Hello, I'm very delighted to have you here, Jakob. You have been working on our Lion server on a text-to-speech model. And given the really low amount of training compute you invested into it, it has already very, very promising results. So I um, would like to hear more about you and the text-to-speech model you're working on. Uh, yeah, it's it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I'm Jakob Piotr-Swapa. I work at Calabra, and we you know, started working on this project to build an open source text-to-speech model. Uh, why do such a thing? Um, so the first thing that comes to mind in text-to-speech is you know, converting articles or books into audiobooks or podcasts. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. But uh, it turns out there are a lot more applications that you can actually use text-to-speech to, uh, in. So one example is uh, you can edit the audio track of a podcast or a video you know, without having to re-record everything from scratch. You can, uh, there was a nice example that we will probably link to a video uh, in the description where you can, for example, replace swear words in a movie after you already shot it, which normally would be very, very problematic, but you can do that with, with text-to-speech, good quality text-to-speech. You can, of course, you know, if you have a support line that people are calling in, you can, you know, automatically create your speech for your interactive voice response system or make announcements in, you know, public spaces like a train station. And of course, a uh, nice thing would, to have would be to combine speech recognition and synthesis. So we can, you know, we have all these chatbots, we can turn them into like real conversational, conversational, conversational partners uh, when you can actually talk to, 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 your, to your AI instead of being forced to chat with it. And um, so whisper speech is, you know, our, our approach to, uh, to create an open source text speech model that delivers natural sounding speech. Um, we you know, want, want to build a model that can be easily fine tuned and integrated, just like you know, right now you can integrate stable diffusion into whatever you're building. And it would be great if you had this text to speech thing that's open source that you could also integrate into, into your projects. Uh, and come up with you know, even better applications than the ones I, I already um, described. Um, another thing is that uh, we are looking at, you know, right now we have an English text to speech model. As you mentioned, it's pretty cool uh, considering how little compute it requires uh, for training, but also for inference. It's not like, very resource intensive. Uh, but you know, in principle, the same tech can be applied to multiple languages, so we could synthesize multiple languages. And similar to how Whisper works, we you know we 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 um, are pretty sure that each additional language would actually reinforce the performance of the model on all other languages, right? So which is great because we keep adding languages and the, and the performance increases. Um, so we, as you mentioned, we are kind of limited by the compute and the uh, Training data set, that's kind of by design. It's not like, you know, uh, Collabra doesn't have the resources, but we want to train a foundational model on data set that have no license restrictions. This limits us quite severely because we want the models to be, you know, uh, commer like, so you can use them commercially without worrying about licensing or, you know, if it's trained on, on data that it's, you know, fully, uh, it's, it's licensed or somebody may, you know, come after you. So we are, forcing ourselves to, to limit ourselves to only these data sets. But, uh, you know, with, in collaboration with Lion, we would love to train a research with speech model on, you know, high quality data you can get from the web and uh, showcase how, you know, what's the real power of the model itself, where it's not limited by whatever data you have available. Um, so maybe, uh, so, one small uh, shameless plug. So Collabra is already talking to several parties interested in commercial applications of, of Whisper Speech. And if you, you know, if you're one of these people who haven't learned about this yet, but you are interested in this and you could, you would love to use it, then you know we would love to help you with integration or deployment or work on new feature improvements. You know, we are 
we, we, we would love to work on open source and you know to improve the capabilities of the open source model we can also do proprietary work if, if required um, so maybe I will say a little bit because this will help us understand what where we we're coming from how did we come up with the idea for whisper speech so it all started with this pure TTS paper from Google which we noticed that you know the quality of the samples they released they didn't release the model they didn't release the code they only released a web page full of samples and they were really good uh, there were a couple of other models at the time that were also really good like Microsoft Natural Speech, for example, but they were very complicated. And uh, Speed TTS seemed almost straightforward. Like the model was pretty simple conceptually. Uh, standard transformer, standard typical models. Uh, of course, if we knew what we knew now, <laughs> it was not so straightforward, but uh, that was like our inspiration. And we said, like, okay, the Speed TTS paper is great. But we are work, we were working on this live transcription thing called Whisper Live. You can check it out on GitHub, uh, which is an open source uh, live transcription uh, system based on Whisper from OpenAI. And Whisper is this amazing model that OpenAI released that was trained on seven hundred thousand hours of speech almost. It has great accuracy, and you know, the Spear TTS they used customized models for speech recognition to create you know, semi-supervised data. They had a custom model for semantic token extraction to extract like, like uh, uh, to extract like, um, not acoustic, but uh, linguistic information. Yes, from the recording. So, to, so, to, to so use, to if I get it synthesis. right, you, you have like a text and the idea is like from the text, you get all the information you need to to speak a text that is independent of the actual speaker's identity, right? Yes, yes. So, so the idea behind the Spirit TTS was to train, like to, to do speech synthesis in two uh, steps. So the first step would be to convert text into some representation that's more phonetic, but it doesn't uh, focus on any particular speaker and then afterwards apply another model that converts this phonetic information to uh, actual acoustic uh, you know waveform or you know um, actual sound and uh, this is they used a, like a spe special model that was trained in a fully unsupervised manner to arrive at this phonetic information which is good, but it's also pretty complicated. Like I tried understanding how this model works and it took me like, you know, two or three days to hunt down the papers and read between the lines because um, it was pretty complicated. So we thought like, since we have this open source model that called Whisper and it seems to be doing stuff that's even better than, you know, semi-supervised phonetic representation, it can actually do go directly from audio into text. Like, can we reuse Whisper? Uh, can we like avoid reinventing the wheel and use Whisper as a component of the system? Uh, and it turns out you can. Uh, so that's basically what we did. So Whisper Speech takes Whisper speech recognition model and uh, trains new models that run it backwards. So instead go of going from text through some you know intermediate representation into sound. Uh, sorry, from sound into text, it actually ran backwards from text back to speech. And uh, to do that, we, as I mentioned, we used like as many open source models as possible. Like Google, of course, used all the proprietary stuff, including a Sunstream. We based this on Encodec and on Whisper. And uh, the insight that that Spirit TTS had that speech synthesis can become like split into these two separate uh, steps. They call this reading and speaking. So the first one is reading, converting like, you know, text representation characters into phonetic representation. And then speaking is about, you know, enriching this with, uh, with uh, information about the speaker, about the voice, is it male or female, the pitch, the intonation, the way mm -hmm. somebody speaks specific words. Um, maybe I can, uh, share my screen and show you some 
yeah, sure. diagrams of how this works. So basically, you use Whisper, the pre-trained information in the Whisper weights, to um, yep. speed up the training of the model that converts text to the semantic tokens. Instead of training the stage completely from scratch, you basically use and recycle the information in Whisper and get it at a shortcut. And this is what gives you a big speed up compute wise. Yes, yes, this is this is what we believe happens. Of course, you can never know for sure with neural networks, but um, I can like let me go through. Maybe we can go through how this model works in practice first mm -hmm. in inference. So when you actually try to generate some speech, so you start with with your input text uh, on the left, and then you actually go for three steps. So and you arrive at the speech waveform that you can just listen to. So the, 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 the uh, yellow things are things you can actually look at, and the green are you know, internal representations that are not really human readable. But uh, the three steps are, we start with reading, which is the T2S model, as we call it. Um, so text to semantic tokens model. And this model starts with the input text, just as like any language model would, and it tokenizes it and you know, converts it into numbers. And then, it adds, um, it converts this into this uh, phonetic representation, adds prosody and emotions, uh, and outputs something called, we call semantic tokens, uh, which are a fixed rate 50 tokens per second um, of information about the speech. So it commits to you know, the tempo, the speed of speaking, and to, as I said, emotions a little bit. And then the second step comes in and takes these semantic tokens. Uh, it adds a speaker embedding, uh, so you can you know, switch speakers. And uh, we have a model called S to A, which is semantic to acoustic, which actually does the speaking. So it adds all the speaker characteristics, and spits out acoustic tokens at 150 tokens per second, so like three times more. So this is, as you may guess, more difficult task because you know you have just a lot more data. And then finally, uh, we are using a vocoder to convert this into high quality speech. So you know the final speech waveform is something like 24,000 uh, you know numbers per second. So we are uncompressing even further. And um, these are the three steps you have to do to um, generate speech. But because these steps are a lot easier than just generating end to end, uh, the model is actually quite fast because these models are not very large and they are still delivering good quality because the tasks they are have, that they have to do are pretty well defined and they are not uh, that difficult, it turns out. So this is how it works in inference. And uh, the secret sauce, so to speak, is the semantic tokens. So as I said, Google used you know, some unsupervised model trained on a lot of data to, to arrive at the semantic tokens. And we instead used Whisper that already has a lot of information encoded into pre-trained Whisper model has a lot of information encoded into it. As you know, we recently somebody discovered in, it even understands like sounds like dog barking and you know other kind of sounds that you may encounter in, in recordings, despite the fact that it was never trained to actually recognize dog barks. So, uh, so what Whisper does is it takes the input speech at sixteen thousand numbers per second. It has two blocks. Um, one is the encoder and the second is the decoder. These are transformer encoders and decoders. And uh, the first one goes from the input speech, you know, through a spectrogram and then into an internal representation we call whisper features. That's basically 50 floating point vectors per second. And from that, uh, we have a whisper decoder that takes these vectors understands which of them go together to form a word and spits out the text. So 
the text is of course varying speed because you know you never know how how fast somebody is going to speak so you have to this this mismatch between the input and output speed so the decoder handles that um, and uh, the decoder looks a lot like a language model. It just has this additional access to this uh, whisper feature, so it doesn't guess at the next word. It can actually, you know, make an educated guess because it, it knows what the speech was. And what we are doing with whisper space is actually we are just inverting these steps to build a text-to-speech system. Um, yeah, and. Um, as you may notice, maybe from when I was talking about this, you can do text to speech. You could also do voice cloning because if you take a look at this, we the the the, the right part stays the same. We just replace the text to semantic token model with an encoder from Whisper. We get the same semantic tokens as before, mm -hmm. and then we can you know continue from that instead of then instead of adding prosody and emotion, mm -hmm. we are preserving prosody and emotion and the pronunciation of words of the original recording, but we change the, the speaker. We can uh, switch to a different speaker. So we can do also voice cloning with this kind of a model without a problem, and it works really well. So like, um, if I understand correctly, like when you do text to speech, the first, the, the text encoder, text to semantic tokens, this is basically your own custom trained model that you trained with the help of the whisper encoder. And if you uh, do voice cloning, you instead use for the first box on the left, um, you use the, the original whisper encoder like it was off the shelf. But um, one trick to get well, tokens is you, you quantize some uh, kind of like features, right? Yes, yes. So like the darker blue boxes are off the shelf models or almost off the shelf models. So what we are doing um, to get these semantic tokens, because if you know how transformer works, transformers work, the whisper features are just long vectors of floating point numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on the model size, of course, they are longer or shorter, but there's, there's just a lot of numbers and there's a lot of information there, not all of it, which is really that important to the work that you're trying to do. And when you want to convert text into these features, you really want just a minimal amount of information to generate just the minimal amount of information that's required to, so that, you know, this is like a two-way transformation that you can go from text into whisper features and then back. Um, so you want to remove unnecessary information. How we did that, it's, we basically took whisper as it is, I can, I think, draw it here. and. We just put a box here, uh, which is a vector quantization module. And then we took a lot of uh, speech, run it through Whisper normally, generated the transcript, and then run it again with the vector quantization module in the middle and train so it actually delivers the same transcripts as, as before. So we forced yeah, the model to. Show, maybe you can show the slide. I think you have another slide. Uh, this, not right? really for this one, unfortunately, no. <laughs> uh, but for the training. Sorry, but yeah, for the training, but but after we already had the, the whisper feature. So um, the idea is, uh, I think the most related idea to this one is distillation. So distillation is where you take a model, you run it forward, and then you take the probabilities of you know whatever mm -hmm. text is appearing on the output. And you train another model to mimic these probabilities. So we are doing a very similar thing here. So we are running, you know, our uh, speech through Whisper. We get all the probabilities of text at different positions, and then we can take another model that's the, the same Whisper blocks without uh, they are like frozen. They are not, we are not training them, but we squeeze in this vector quantization module in the middle, which forces it so that. Basically, what we're doing is that out of these 50 vectors per second, each vector can only assume one, uh, one value out of uh, 1,024 values. So we are forcing the model to choose only from a very limited vocabulary. And you know, surprisingly or not, this actually works very well. So 
it turns out there are not there's not a lot of data in these features. You can squeeze them out very tightly, and you know afterwards you can you could use this as a whisper replacement, although there's not much reason to do so. But instead, you can take this part, so the encoder with the effective quantization module, mm -hmm. or half of it, right? Because it, it first quantizes it unquantized, so it whisper doesn't yeah, like yeah. We, we, we end up. You so know. Bas basically, you get like an encoder and, that encodes any audio into your uh, yes. Statements. And this is what I call the quantized whisper encoder. So it takes speech as the input. Does the mouse spectrogram thing just like normal whisper? Then it runs the encoder only, and then it quantizes the output from the encoder and gives me fifty uh, integers per second, with all the information you need to actually, like you know, retrieve the original text that was included in the speech. Because this is a fixed rate thing, so it's all always fifty you know tokens per second. It preserves prosody and emotion because. It has to, like it cannot compress this out because it's it's fixed rate. So you can notice, for example, if you look at the semantic tokens that a lot of them are just repeated. So there are like, you know, a few positions and a few points in time, you have basically the same phonetic thing. It doesn't change. If somebody's sticking slowly, then there will be more repeats. So this presentation is really nice because it only preserves some of this information, it drops completely the speaker identity. It drops, you know, unnecessary information. We squeeze it out pretty tightly. And uh, it helps us because now what we can do is we can build these two models, which are normal transformer models, like you would do for, you know, translation, for example, where it takes in tokens, uh, text or semantic, and it also outputs tokens. So it will output, you know, the first one will output semantic tokens, the second one will output acoustic tokens. With, you know, we train it with normal cross entropy loss, like you would train any, you know, model that, that handles text, for example. So that's a nice thing. And uh, I can like tell you how this works in, in practice to train these models. So what we would do, uh, let's maybe start with the second one. So the semantic to acoustic, Training is nice because it doesn't require really supervision. It's unsupervised. So we start with input speech. We use the quantized whisper encoder to get the semantic tokens. We use encodec, which is you know, the open source meta, uh, like open source uh, audio compression model released by meta. It outputs acoustic tokens. If you remember, these were like 50 per second. These were like 150 per second for the 1.5 kilobit per second version of encodec. And then we pass these semantic tokens into the S2A model, semantic to acoustic model. It, and what we wanted to spit out these tokens. And we, you know, we just use cross entropy loss to uh, to force it to force it to spit out the correct acoustic tokens. And uh, because you know we have data from multiple speakers, we add one more thing, which is we add the speaker embedding, so the model can learn the different speakers have different characteristics, and uh, it learns you know from multiple speakers, and at the same time it can mimic multiple speakers. With can respect speaker to speaker embedding. embedding, is this like for every speaker just a fixed random vector, or is it like you learn it on the fly and it's also backpropped? Uh, so. This is backpropped. We are learning this, but we are learning this during the learning of the whole model. But this starts out as a random vector of numbers. That's you know the same width of, as the internal model representation. We add it up, and then we learn it using backprop. So it you know it and actually it's it's really good. It works really good because I was doing some work on fine tuning, um, like a couple of days ago, and I had to reset the matrix to random numbers so I could actually train it on another data set with completely different speakers. Mm -hmm. So I reset it and then I was surprised because it already did pretty good. And I said, no, I did something wrong. So I took the model in inference, I reset the speaker embeddings to random numbers and it generated perfect speech. <laughs> so every uh, basically embedding you can come up with, random embedding, it's generating sensible speech. 
So it's it's pretty cool. I didn't expect that. I would expect this that you know the speaker embeddings that they are special. You need to use the exact ones you trained on, but it turns out you don't have to do that. Um, you can actually just uh, like choose them almost at random and get you know sensible sounding speech. But, but I was surprised also, by that. You could also later um, freeze everything except the speaker models and then train it for a little bit data and get. An identity yes. vector. Yes. Yeah, so uh, let me just like uh, so the reason we did this like this is like you know everybody else is training models to do prompting. So you give it a little bit of speech of somebody speaking something, and then it continues with the same voice. But like to me, it doesn't seem like this has a lot of honest applications and a lot of these honest ones. So. We thought that you know, let's make it just a little bit more difficult, and we decided to to not accept audio as an input. So the voice cloning shouldn't be you know so easy. But as you as you said, of course, you can take the model, you know, freeze the model, take unfreeze only the speaker embeddings, and train on a different data set, and you will get you will get you know be able to do voice cloning on somebody's voice. You would probably need a little is, bit more than three seconds the, to do the, that. The thing is about like the applications. I think this will be very, very huge and lots of creative applications for um, doing all kinds of like chatbots. Or for example, if I want to record a video with my voice for my YouTube channel, sure. but I, um, uh, for whatever reason, I don't want to use my own voice. Or if I want to do like dubbing of some whatever, like cheap, YouTube documentary and I cannot afford good voice actors so I can use like like voices of people who I have consent of so yeah. the thing is I, I already can do this and all the dishonest people who want to do dishonest stuff can do this already with proprietary systems like 11 labs or whatever and there will be many more in the near future but the thing is the fact that we would have like a really good open source alternative would democratize it and enable people much more easily to like use it for all the positive stuff they want to use it for. Of course, of course, yeah. Uh, in your example, if you have you know your own YouTube channel, you probably have already a couple of hours of you know recordings of your own voice, or you can just do it. So it's okay. You just plug it in, you train this your speaker embedding, and then you're good to go. Uh, you could probably also fine tune. Uh, the model a little bit to get even better results, right? So you mostly train the speaker embeddings, but you also fine tune the model a little bit, just like you do with stable diffusion, right? Like you take, I don't know, a hundred images, and you can fine tune the model to really perfect the style. And you know, I've seen people do, do it to their own drawings, to their own uh, graphics, and it's it's great, right? Like they can then use this it's to, to generate crazy. new content. Like stable diffusion XL came out one week ago. And if you go to some of these fine tuning uh, sites where people share fine tunes, like uh, Civit AI is one, for example, there are fine tunes that even have like better quality than the original Stable Diffusion XL. Like yeah. uh, there are several, like and some uh, task specific, some for anime, some like for paintings and for drawings, but some who can generate like really, really realistic photos. Yeah, definitely. And this is something we really hope to achieve with this uh, model as well. So you can take it and you can fine tune it to your, you know, your usage and, uh, and get really great results. That's, that's what we want to do. And it works. Like I, you know, I, the whole model is trained on Libre Lite, which is this very big public domain data set of audiobooks. But the quality of these audiobook recordings is, is pretty mixed. So some of them are good, some of them are pretty terrible. Uh, and um, you can, like I already tested out, you can fine tune this model on, for example, Libre TTS or the recent Libre TTS R data set that Google released, which they had, they have this proprietary model to clean up audio in, uh, to studio quality and they just run the whole Libre TS through this uh, model and they come up with a really high quality uh, speech data set but it's only 600 hours but you can take this data set fine tune the the whole um, s to a model you just need this part the other parts stays fixed and uh, 
And you get you know much higher quality and a bigger selection of high quality voices than you would get from the base model. So yeah, that's definitely possible. Um, and you can do that. Um, yeah, so this is this is how this part works. We also well, have one, to... one thing, yep. like can, if you can go back, like one thing sure. that I didn't really understand is you have EN codec 1.5 kilobits per second. And like EN codec is this codec that basically converts your audio into like a sequence of tokens of discrete numbers. Yep. And I have been playing with this a little bit and I discovered that at six kilobit per second, it begins to sound really, really decent, really good. And 1.5, you can understand what they're talking about, but it's like old radio or so. So I was wondering, why do you choose to take first a low bitrate EN codec representation and later use this other model, VOCOS, the, the VOCODAR? Like, I think this is probably something like a generative adversary network that somehow fixes the low quality and is probably only restricted at the moment to a speech, I guess. Yes. So, so we started with Encodec 1.5 because it was the like smallest one. So we started our experiments and started training models just to make sure that we can generate coherent speech. As as you said, it works, and the speech sounds yeah like an old radio or just a really low quality recording. And that was kind of disappointing. Although we were very happy that you know we get coherent speech and it follows the the text closely and it it works. Um, then we started trying to improve it, and um, actually, uh, Google uh, did a very similar thing. They used I think three kilobits per second, and you know got this great quality out of it, but. We looked at it a little bit. It doesn't work. Like they say that it's a soundstream and co codec, but it just doesn't match. If you look at soundstream examples, they are not nearly as good as the samples shared for speech TTS. So they trained a custom speech codec to do that. And we really wanted to avoid that because you know you can train everything from scratch your own, but then you miss out on all the improvements that you know the community is building on. So we try training on encodec three kilobits per second, but it turns out, you know, the more tokens you add, the more the, the, the more you increase the bit rate, the more the S to A model is, uh, you know, has to be bigger and slower to train, and uh, it just takes a long while. So, for example, the three kilobit per second model was training for basically two times longer, and the result was higher quality, but it would be it would mumble quite a bit. So we discovered that there's a, this trade-off between um, higher audio quality and uh, you know better speech quality, better understanding of uh, more uh, more intelligible intelligible speech. And fortunately, our bets on focusing on open source models and open source stack paid off because completely independently, a company called Character from actually from Poland, from the same country I am from, uh, built this model that takes encodec at you know, whatever uh, bitrate you want and synthesizes high quality speech from the existing encodec tokens. And as you said, this is like a GAN based vocoder and it solved all our problems. Like we spent quite a bit of time trying to solve it ourselves and uh, yeah, somebody else beat us to it, which is great because now we can just plug in this open source model and uh, and you know, deliver a lot better quality audio. You can notice a, a, a trend here. So the idea is for each model to just add the tiniest little bit of information possible to push towards the you know from text to audio, and not not too much because the more you ask the model to add, the bigger the model has to become. So for example, if you listen to our samples, these are from forty mega parameter models 40 million parameters for both the text uh, text to semantic and semantic to acoustic model these are tiny if you compare it to what google released with spear tts they have a 24 layer transformer which is probably you know in the giga parameter range and yeah okay they have a little bit better quality than we do but they paid a big price for this both in you know training compute 
But then, of course, then in inference compute as well, because if you want to deploy this model in your laptop to you know, voice over your videos, you really don't want to be running this overnight and burning your battery and you know, overheating your laptop. You want these models to be as small as possible, unless you're Google and the only thing you care about is you know, selling cloud, then <laughs> you really want people to believe that these models have to be huge to do anything useful, right? But I don't think this is true. You can actually get, with a little bit of you know, cleverness, you can get high quality out of a lot smaller models than you would otherwise believe. So that's what we did here. And that's why we ch just chose to stick to the 1.5 kilobits per second, because honestly, in my opinion, the focus output is, is competitive with low six kilobits per second and codec for speech. And you know, to train a six kilobit per second model, it would require a lot larger model and training for a lot longer. So why do this if you can just plug in a, an off-the-shelf solution to this problem that you know it can be trained and supervised in a lot less data, and it works, right? The encoded tokens at 1.5 kilobits contain enough information to preserve both the speaker identity and the you know basically full speaker repertoire of like sounds people make during speaking, and yeah, we just then clean it up using uh, using this vocals thing. This is basically how, how these things were always done the, in the text-to-speech domain. But traditionally, this would be that the semantic to acoustic model, this, this he, oh, sorry. Um, this thing here would be um, not acoustic tokens, but this would be like a MEL spectrogram. So the model would generate a MEL spectrogram, mm -hmm. and this would go through a vocoder into you know, the audio uh, samples. And this vocals thing is actually just like a vocoder like this. So it can take in MEL spectrograms. There's one pre-trained model that takes in MEL spectrograms. But there's another one that takes in encoded encoded tokens and just spits out you know, high quality speech. So it's the same basic architecture is just trained on a little bit different data. Which is great because you know modeling acoustic tokens is easier than modeling MEL spectrograms, and you can use cross entropy loss, which for some reason you know does magic to models. It's just so much easier to train a model with cross entropy loss than it is to train a model with, uh, you know, L two loss, like you know squared distance between the MEL, you know target and sort and, and generated MEL spectrogram, uh, which is, I believe fundamental in some way. So, okay, this is not speculation, but uh, I was trained as a, you know, electronic, electrical engineer and in, you know, telecommunications, stuff like this. And one thing that I, I remember from my lectures was that everything digital is a lot better than analog. And one interesting example was that speech, human speech is actually digital, right? Like we have a fixed repertoire of words and you cannot have a word that's, you know, halfway in the middle between a cat and a dog. There's no such thing. You either have a cat, you have a dog, you can combine them in different combinations, but you, you know, if I'm listening to you, I have this margin of error where you say something and I will guess, okay, this, you said cat because it sounds more cat than dog and I can clean it up. Yeah, this the same thing really happens in digital logic, right? I, I have been thinking about this uh, for some while and I think maybe to communicate ideas between individuals, it is very, very helpful to quantize your idea space, because like this is what speech basically does. If you have in your mind like a certain pattern of neural activations, and this represents something like a semantic embedding, like an idea, like like a vec an idea vector or whatever you want to call this this, this pattern, yeah. and you want to communicate it to me, um, you you cannot send telepathically all your ideas and all fine de details how you imagine this and so into my head you have to break it down into quantized into discrete words that you can then vocalize and everyone can vocalize them and understand them and later decode them into a similar idea that is not the same but pretty close yeah yeah definitely uh one thing that, that this applies to very much, not in the human realm, but in the, in the computer realm, is that one benefit of this is that you get 
uh, noise, uh, you're, you're, you have like, you, you can leave, live with noise in your signals because you can always perfectly reproduce, like re reduce them to, you know, these discrete representations on the other end. So even if there is, you know, the communication is noisy, even if the, you know, you're, the transmission is not perfect between these systems, you still can reproduce the, the signal perfectly because it can only take up these discrete values. So of course we use this all the time in digital computers. That's why we use digital computers, not analog ones, right? Because you can stack modules, you know, doing computation on stuff. You know, you can do thousands of modules and at each step you commit that this is a number, a, a digital number, and not just some voltage that can fluctuate. And yeah, this digital yeah. number, you can retrieve it perfectly after, you know, at some time or, yeah. you know, for the next step, you can always uh, recreate the perfect representation. So I think there's something fundamental about this. And the fact that we have the same thing in our speech, where you're, we are communicating not by, you know, some vogue howls that have varying pitch and you decode the pitch into the information, you actually have words that are very, very uh, quantized, right? Like they are, they are the ultimate quantized representation. And um, I think this applies to models as well. So for example, you have this thing where people are were worrying a lot about language models, where you train them with the ground truth data. And then during inference, it generates the token itself. So it, it works on different data, right? It, to generate the 10th token, it looks at nine previous tokens. During training, this would be the ground truth data. During inference, it would be the, its own generations. Like how does it work? Why does it work so well? I'm pretty sure the answer is that it's just this noise immunity because you have to commit to one single token. It's self-correcting. It will try it, it because of that. This you know space of of possible answers is limited. Then you can actually train a sensible model that is. After some point, it becomes self-correcting, and even if it synthesizes something it will always know how to recover from that, right? And in an infinite space of, of continuous floating point values, that would be very, very difficult, right? Because you would have these small pockets where it doesn't know what to do because it never seen this vector. And with a limited vocabulary of, of tokens, it, it can always recover afterwards. Even if it, you know, starts with something stupid, it can it, recover. It's a little bit like- and It mostly if works. You, if you like uh, learning a new language, and you don't know how to pronounce a word, there are these um, dictionaries where you have like a pho phoneme notation, where you have like yep. notations. And I can think of this as very similar to the semantic tokens. They are independent of the speaker, but they are a little bit like the phoneme notations that you would have in a very, very detailed dictionary notation style. Yeah, that's true. Um... I think there's just one little difference is that the dictionary normally doesn't say how long do you have to pronounce each sound. This is something you just have to learn on your own, right? It's not like full information, but our semantic tokens contain this information. So if you know somebody is holding a, a sound for a longer time, we will have two or three semantic tokens for it. Um, so yeah, going back to this, um, we have to text the semantic token model, which starts, like we train it by starting with input speech. We push it through whisper, just normal whisper model, whisper large version two, for example. We get the text. So this is what you would say like weekly supervised, I guess. So we don't actually need the transcripts during training. We just need the speech, which is great. We you know, run the same uh, speech, the same audio through the quantized whisper encoder to get the semantic tokens. And then we train a model to predict the semantic tokens from text. And uh, these models are almost the same. The only difference is that this text to semantic token model is more similar to Whisper. So it, the other way around. So it consumes text in you know, varying speed and outputs semantic tokens at constant speed. The, acoustic, uh, the semantic to acoustic model, it's nice in this way that the input and the output are like fixed rate. So you don't actually have to use cross attention, for example, to, to tie them in. So it's a little, a little bit easier to train uh, thanks to that and this one. But fortunately the text to semantic mo uh, model is like this simpler one, it seems from at least from our experiments. So uh, 
we can train this one with cross attention and it, it still works pretty well. Is the text so, to semantic model uh, something like a encoder decoder transformer or is it like, yeah, like, like, like a standard vanilla transformer, right? So this is an encoder decoder transformer. Um, we, I decided to standardize on, you know, almost the same basic architecture in all the models to just make the code base like more understandable and it make it easier to, you know, apply in, in improvements. So the text to semantic model is the standard encoder decoder model with cross attention between the encoder and decoder. The semantic to acoustic model is also encoder decoder based. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but instead of cross attention, we just take the outputs from the encoder and we add them in into the, uh, with a little bit of padding because the rates don't match. So we like, we uh, enlarge the vector a little bit and, you know, add padding uh, in the middle between the vectors. And we add it to the, you know, during training, we have the acoustic tokens uh, as the input. And then we predict the next acoustic token, just like in a language model. And we just add in additional context from the semantic tokens into this representation. Uh, and it works pretty well. The nice thing about an encoder decoder model compared to, for example, you know, decoder only um, is that the encoder can look both forwards and backwards in time. So if the semantic tokens, you know, you have to look a little bit into the future to see what, you know, what will come afterwards to understand which word we are going to pronounce and which sounds are we going to, you know, we, we need to join them smoothly. So it, it makes sense mm -hmm. to look a little bit in the future to see what's going to come up the words in a little bit. But with a decoder, you cannot do that because then it will cheat and just look up the, you know, the future tokens and just output them directly. So you cannot give it really future information. You only can give it access to the past. But if we have an encoder, it can, you know, shuffle this information around and enrich the representation. So, the, so it's easier to do part, the task. The, 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 the encoder part of the semantic to acoustic model would see, for example, already 50 or 60 or 70 semantic tokens. And then from this information, start generating the first acoustic token, then the next one. And while he did, it can already look at all these 50, 60 semantic tokens. And at some point, maybe as the semantic tokens grow a little bit, because uh, time progresses. So like for initially we had 50 semantic tokens and we had 55, 60, 65, then maybe the first ones get a little bit shifted like a sliding window, they fly out of the window of the attention window, but it always has like the um, neighborhood of semantic tokens that it can always pay attention to, to reason what would be the most likely acoustic token. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly how it works. Um, oh, maybe, you know, minus the sliding window, we don't have that yet. But yeah, that's definitely something that could be implemented. And, uh, you know, there are relative uh, positional encodings that you could use for that as well. So we don't have this right now. One interesting thing we, we, we wanted to share is that first we started with a semantic to acoustic model that was purely autoregressive and it just generated one token at a time. And if you know a little bit how encoding works, is that it actually outputs multiple tokens per time step, not just a single one. So the 1.5 kilobit per second model actually outputs two tokens every time step. So it's two tokens 70, 75 times per second. And uh, what we did, um, we actually, you know, we didn't come up with, with this ourselves. There's this interesting paper from Meta called uh, Music Gen, where they uh, come up with this idea that you can actually generate these tokens at the same time to speed it up. Because otherwise you have to generate, you know, a lot of like 4,500 4, 4, tokens, for example, in, you know, linear progression. And that's a lot of tokens. That's quite a big context. Of course, it's, you know, not state of the art language models can have bigger context, but the more context, the, the bigger the context, the more expensive the model is to evaluate, which is why OpenAI needs a lot of, you know, compute to, to handle ChatGP. Um, so what they did instead is you can actually predict them in, in parallel a little bit with a small twist. So you predict the first token 
of the first time step only. Then you, on the second time step, you predict the first token of the second time step and the second token of the first time step. And it like predict the, like the, 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 the tokens, you predict them with a slight uh, delay. So you have this contextual information, but you can still predict them basically all at the same time because you just have you know, a few heads on top of your transformer. You don't run the whole transformer for every token. You just run it for every time step. That's a nice thing. Another nice thing that a lot of people are excited about was the Soundstorm model from Google, which uses the same basic uh, architecture. It just predicts everything at once. So you input all the semantic tokens and you output all acoustic tokens or almost all acoustic tokens at the same time. Of course, mm -hmm. you cannot really do this because that doesn't work. What they do instead is they do a little bit, I think, similar to how the uh, image generation model works with diffusion. So they run this model, the semantic to acoustic model, like 20 times. And they keep uh, choosing, like they, they choose only the most confident tokens and they then feed them in back into the input and then run it again and again and again. A little bit like diffusion, reducing the noise over time and you know, predicting more accurate representation. This is cool, but the problem with this is, as you may notice, if you look at people trying to reproduce this research, is that you really need a very big model to, to be able to do this successfully. So the autoregressive prediction may be slower, but it's a lot easier to train and a lot faster to actually infer. In principle, you know, running the whole thing at the same time should be a lot faster, but if your model is you know, 20 times bigger, then you kind of lose this advantage because you have to just you know, have a lot more GPU RAM to be able to run this at all. And then you have to do a lot more compute per step. So you, know, you trade less steps for more compute intensive steps. That's not a tr trivial trade-off. So this is I'm something we're looking about, into. Talking about yep. diffusion, I was also really uh, excited about the Refusion project where they converted uh, music into images and then like like ML spectrograms and then fine tune stable diffusion to uh, mm. generate ML spectrograms and it actually works like it sounds a little bit like from an old radio but mm. um, before I learned about the progress of your project I was really thinking about maybe we could fine tune stable diffusion XL at a higher resolution with really high res ML spectrograms and I'm pretty sure that would probably work, but it would probably be pretty wasteful with respect to inference compute, because later you would always have to use stable diffusion and the stable diffusion XL, and it's like 3.5 billion parameters. So um, like having a model like yours that already uses the compressed information in the whisper and in the quantized whisper encoder is probably much more useful for, for speech in this example. Yeah, I've seen the refusion project and it, it was, it's, it's a really great idea, but I agree with you. Like I suspect that it would work, but it would require a lot more compute than this approach. Um, and, you know, we are like, I'm coming from an originally from an embedded systems background. I spent uh, many years doing embedded systems. so. I tend to be always like a little bit resource conscious and you know how much this is going to uh, cost us in, in the long run in inference and how you know expensive it will be to run and send off the model and stuff like that. So uh, I tend to like try start with smaller models and then you know scale them up instead of uh, taking the big cannon and, and, and just firing it at the problem. But it will probably work as well, uh, I agree. Uh, one thing that we could also do here, which is, uh, which is what we want to do here in the future together, is there's nothing that really prevents us from adding more information into this semantic to acoustic model inputs. So instead of just the semantic tokens and the speaker embeddings, we could, for example, have some emotion in you know, conditioning here, or we could have you know, something we could predict pitch independently. There is a nice paper from, from NVIDIA that shows that if you independently predict the pitch of this, of the voice, you can actually, um, like 
the, the task of, of, of generating speech becomes easier, but also you can control the pitch directly. You could, for example, make it, you know, uh, make the deviation of the pitch from the mean higher to make it more emotive or to sound like somebody's, you know, uh, modulating their, vo their voice more strongly, or you can make it lower to convert, you know, male to female voice and things like that. And uh, you can actually control the pitch of the voice. So you can, you know, make somebody speak very like a, a mice, and then you can do some deep voice. So you can do it and control this very easily with a pitch. So you can add all these other conditionings to help the model generate these tokens. And it means that you can use a smaller model because you, you know, it's an interesting thing because, you know, we went from doing this, uh, these uh, features like hard coded features or like hand engineered features to end to end systems and then back to Spear TDS, for example, which takes these, you know, intermediate features that are kind of hard hand crafted, they are not learned end to end, and then uses it to simplify the data generation task. But um, the fun thing is, which is my hypothesis, that you can use a lot of classification systems, which are always easier to train than generative systems, right? Because for classification, you're reducing information you're like taking a lot of information reducing it to the you know most important parts for the generative part you actually have to do the other way around that you have to imagine all the different possibilities so for example if an an image net label that's a duck you have to be able to imagine all the possible ducks instead of just figuring out what makes a duck and you know if this is a duck or something else so i think we can reuse all these uh, like we reused whisper we re you reused whisper because it understood language based on speech you could really use other classifier models, so to speak, where it go from like high dimensional representation like speech into something like emotion classification, and then reuse it in a generative model to make the task easier. So instead of the model having to figure out, okay, maybe this is shouting, we can just tell it, yeah, this is shouting. You don't have to guess this. You don't have to sample this, you know, from your during sampling. You can just know this is this is supposed to be sampling shouting please give me shouting and then you don't need to like come up with this from you know clues uh, that were put there in the text for example right and you don't really you cannot really put all the clues into text because for some reason there is this thing called voice acting where people spend a lot of actual uh time to 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 perfect the skill of you know, reading text in a in an emotive manner, so it actually conveys yeah, so like emotion. For emotive text to speech, I have had yep. like some really cool ideas. So before I studied, so I, like by 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 my studies, I'm a computer science high school teacher. But before this, I also studied psychology for uh, like a few years, and I also studied acting. So I have mm. background in acting as well, and I have been thinking a lot about how to get really good emotion recognition and emotion synthesis and i think the, the 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 best path the best approach would be to train a contrastive embedding between the audio and the image modality or video modality so that you can get um the audio like for a speaker embedding or for a speech embedding into the same space as you can get like the facial expressions, the micro expressions and the, the, the body pose and everything. Because like, for example, imagine you come home, you find your mother or your girlfriend and she's sitting at the table and she's just plainly sitting there and she's not moving anything. And you just look at her eyes and you can instantly feel that she's sad or that she's happy or whatever, like, or that she's scared. And you cannot describe it with, with words. And it's not like in these um, artificial uh, emotion data sets where the actors are exaggerating, overacting the emotions. Like, it's not like this. Like, in real life, you have so many really small, fine-grained tones of emotions that people do not decide deliberately to express them, but they, they rather, like, are an expression of all the stimuli they perceive and think and and so and so like if we would have like hundreds or, um, or thousands or tens of thousands of hours of really 
authentic emotional expressions where we have the voice and the face and we could get them into the same semantic space then this would be i think a really good guiding information like a conditioning and i have been playing around with stable diffusion xl if you say generate me an image of like a woman i don't know and she's sad or she's happy it can do it but if you refine the text like a woman who is um, very who who expresses nostalgic sadness with some authentic happiness that is really fragile and vulnerable or whatever like if you add this and you play a little bit with it at some point you can really get images that really catch these emotions and this shows me that the big clip models because stable diffusion xl is using the open clip big g model so the, the really big contrastive image text models, they catch lots of nuances of emotions. They probably learned it somehow from billions of images, maybe not perfect, but pretty good. And one easy thing that we would like to try out in the future is to try, can we like, for example, take three seconds of audio where we have some kind of expressive speech from a video, for example, and then sure. takes a center frame or a random frame and assume that if you have a speaker here in the like in this video, so we can detect first, is there a human visible in the video? Yes, there's a human. So we infer probably the human that is visible is the one who is speaking. And then we contrastively train it at, at bigger scale. And I hope at some point we, we can get the audio embedding into the clip space. So then we would have like the audio encoder that could convert like audio into a vector or like a list of numbers, but that is in the same space as the clip image encoder, but also at the same time, at the, in the same space as the clip text encoder. So we could also later then write any text about emotional expressions and if we would have like a big database of audio snippets, we encode them and could retrieve those that are semantically close, even though we never ever had trained it on any text audio data, just text image data. And we don't really have a really good video clip right now, like a clip that can catch temporal developments of expressions or like how processes develop over 10 seconds in a video we don't have such a good open source video clip model but i think we will have such models in the future and then um i think the, the way forward to get really really high quality emotion embeddings is to just take big amounts of data from videos where you have like a speaker and or like a human and some audio and then contrastively train this and then later once you have this aligned the audio of the, the speech and the micro expressions of like what a human in a documentary or a really good actor or so seems to be experiencing if you can get this into one semantic numerical space then later you can fine-tune text models to to steer it to orchestrate it with with text or you could just have like an actor you could have like an actor or like whoever who is um just doing his his voice acting and later you perform something like voice cloning and you say okay i want this to be a little bit more sad or a little bit more happy Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds really nice, and uh, it's a really clever way to sidestep the fact that we don't really have a, any sizable data sets where you have, you know, some kind of uh, audio and a good uh, representation of what kind of emotions are there, right? And as you said, yeah, the, the image models already have this information; they already understand these emotions exactly. pretty well. That's a really great idea, I think. Um, I, I think like if you want to generate really, really authentic, touching emotional expression with all the micro things that are going on, it's a dead end to only rely on text descriptions because it's too hard. It's you you cannot describe it 
it, it's really hard to describe all these fine nuances with words. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Um, one thing that uh, I was thinking about as well is that, as you notice here, we have this speaker embedding, but we don't have anything similar here. So if we know that the semantic tokens already come, you know, have some information about prosody and emotion, we should allow the model to actually have some kind of an embedding that helps it guide the generation, right? So it can generate multiple things from the same text because that's what ultimately we're talking about, right? Like we need to generate multiple different ways of speaking something from the same exact text, repre text representation. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, we, we should definitely feel, think about adding more of these conditioning vectors coming from multiple models. The fun thing is, there's nothing really stopping us, right? Like we can add multiple things here. They don't have to be, like we don't have to have a single source of truth or the single source of semantic tokens. We can have multiple and add them together to help the model deliver the performance we want it to deliver, right? So we could extract yeah. them from existing clip and try to carry over the emotions. We can extract, you know, we could describe it with text, as you mentioned and create this vector from text uh, in the clip space, for example. So we can do all of these things and uh, help generate better quality uh, speech. Yeah, like, like another thing that we had been discussing off mic was um, training on noisy speech data from the web and conditioning the uh, maybe both stages maybe the uh, text to semantic and semantic onto acoustic on uh, clap embeddings basically audio clip like like trained on speech and sound effects and music so that like for example if you have a sentence this is a test sentence and you have some kind of noise in the background because some cars are driving by and some wind is blowing then you can provide it with the information in the form of a clip, clap embedding that there should be wind in a car and then it learns okay yeah i should generate um like speech about this is a test sentence but with some background noise that somehow sounds like wind in a car and it, it still can learn from it and later once you have your model trained on lots of lots of abundant uh, um, uh, like voice only data that you can get from wherever from the whole web then later you fine tune it a little bit or condition it to generate only clean voices but it already had learned so much from all the noisy data but because if you would neglect all the noisy, noisy data from the first from the beginning from the first place then you would have much less data to, to learn from Yes, that's that's true. Uh, it's also related to another paper that recently came out, which is was called Whisper AT, right? Which showed that you can use Whisper features, so basically the same thing that that we are using here as semantic tokens, and use it to classify, you know, other kinds of sounds that may occur in the background. That Whisper is good at figuring out that you know there was a dog barking or a car was driving by and made a noise. So Whisper is actually really really good at you know. Uh, classifying these sounds and uh, yeah definitely that could be used so the model knows that there should be a car so it will synthesize a car but then later during inference you will remove this information that there should be a car and you will get a speech without a car because it knows that these are two separate processes and then you can like you can they should be merged they should be like added together but it can learn them separately if it knows that there's that they are there Instead, what we are currently seeing with these models, if you train on noisy data, is that they understand that this speaker is just somebody who's always accompanied with a noise of a car. So yeah, we just have to figure this out. Like we have to add it together into the speaker. So you cannot really disassociate the speaker from the noises in the background, probably. You know, it's some a little bit you can if the noise is localized in time, so it can be averaged out. But in a lot of cases, you know, you just end up with worse speaker embedding. So if the noise is, for example, something that comes from a lower quality microphone, this is much more challenging because it's correlated to the speech. So it just seems like this guy has a really strange voice 
chords, right? <laughs> and voice track that just delivers this distorted audio. You, the model has no capability to guess that this is just a microphone that's not really uh, his voice. And unfortunately, this happens. So there is this in this library light data set. There is, you know, I don't want to say bad things about the guy because he did read a thousand four hundred hours of audiobooks in English, which is a you know a very big undertaking. But it is a little bit unfortunate that his microphone was really really poor, and the, the quality of the recording is you know leaves a lot to be desired. But we still learn something from it, and it's still useful because it's you know one point four thousand hours. What the data set is this? The, this is Libri Lite, which is generated from LibriVox audiobooks. So this is there is this project called LibriVox, which people voluntarily read public domain books mm. and record themselves. And you know, you got all these public domain audiobooks, and they have a really big collection of audiobooks in English. Like as I said, the Libri Lite data set that is derived from this platform is more like about sixty thousand hours of speech. And it's pure speech. There's there's no background noise. There's no music. So it's mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to train on this. But unfortunately, no, not a lot of these people have professional gear. So the quality of the recordings are are not. They're all they were also done over you know ten or or fifteen years. So yeah, you know the quality of 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 the hardware was also not as it is today. Not a lot of people had YouTuber microphones back then. So the quality of these recordings varies a lot. And I know this exactly because I started by training a single speaker model. So of course I chose the you know the largest available uh, group of files from a single speaker. And then I discovered that this guy really it he just you know doesn't sound that great. <laughs> so it, all the speech I synthesized, of course, sounded exactly like him. So it was you know that, that didn't sound that great, unfortunately. But, 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 but if we would have a classifier for Classifying the quality, the speaker or the microphone quality on the microphone quality and the speaker quality, and the model could learn to generate on purpose speech from someone with a low quality microphone. And later, if you train it or if during inference, if you say, okay, now I want you to generate the speech of this someone with a high quality microphone because it previously learned how a high quality microphone was it sounds like then it could maybe do this uh yeah yeah that's possible that's probably not very easy but yeah i i don't see why it shouldn't work um uh, it a little bit works like you know uh if you train on a multi-speaker data set or fine-tune on a higher quality multi-speaker data set, you kind of get this, the same effect. So it will learn to speak using this guy, but it will just, but yeah, if you don't have this classifier, the only thing it can do is put this information into the speaker embedding. Yeah. And if you had yeah. another information, like this is quality mm -hmm. that goes in, then you could imagine having this model the ability to actually clean up his voice. So yeah, you exactly. could try to toggle this bit and, for example, recreate better quality uh, recordings of, uh, I don't know, you know, JFK or other historical figures where we have a really terrible quality recordings because yeah, the you could also hardware at the time this, is not that. You could also use this for noise cancellation or quality improvement. If you have a small model during voice call, imagine you have something like this uh, first, taking your audio, putting it to Quantized Whisper Encoder, getting semantic tokens and your identity vector, and then um, conditioning it during the decoding with the semantic to acoustic tokens on high quality. And then it comes out. So you could like have like a Zoom call with someone or a phone call. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. You have a really bad was... microphone and you are, you are in a very bad mood. <laughs> and it sounds like as if you're in a wonderful mood and you have the best microphone ever. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's true. One idea that I had that I didn't have time to pursue, unfortunately, you know, you always have more ideas than time to, to, to do them, is that we now have this interesting data set from Google, which is Libre TTS, but high quality. So we have, you know, two sets of recordings. They didn't release the model, so we cannot just use it. But could we see what happens in the speaker embeddings between these two data sets. So if you take a low quality recording of somebody's voice and then 
you do the same with the high quality recording of the same guy's voice. It's synthetic, but like, well, yeah, well, well, who cares? And see yeah, what then happens then what in the speaker embeddings. Maybe you can just remove the low quality from the speaker embedding and get high, high quality. Exactly. You can just average the embedding. Like this has been working with image clip aesthetics embeddings. For example, if yeah. you have like um, 1000 really pretty images and you take the average of their clip embeddings, then you get one embedding. And if you add this to a query, so you have like a search query, um, a cat with a party hat, and you remove this embedding, then you get like a not so pretty cat. But if you add it to the query embedding, you get a really pretty cat with a party hat. Yeah, yeah, that's true. This is this was also happening with text, really, right? So, for example, I you know played a little bit with stable diffusion, and you know there was a lot of controversy about how stable diffusion like flag flaggerizes work. But what if you just work with it? You'll notice that if you add Greg Grudkowski to something, it's not like it you know copies the style of Greg Grudkowski unless the image you're generating is actually a wizard you know casting a spell on a on a dragon. So, okay, if you do that, then you will get Greg Rukowski because this is what he drew. But if you just add Greg Rukowski to random prompt, you will just get very high quality images because the model seen so many great high quality images from Greg Rukowski that it thinks Greg Rukowski means high quality. Mm -hmm. And that's what basically happens, right? So people are adding Greg Rukowski not to plagiarize Greg Rukowski, but to just get higher quality because he's a synonym for high quality. It's a little bit like, you know, Adidas become a synonym for running shoes, despite the fact in a lot of languages around the world, despite the fact that you know not, that's not the only company making running shoes. So th these are these things that these models learn that are kind of surprising, but makes sense if you think about it. Like if it seems so many images that are high quality coming from this person, that just mention of his name brings back these memories of high quality images. Yeah. So like, and the example, same thing could happen here. Yes, for example, if you have like a 100 hour really high quality data set from several speakers, you can just like train it with all the speakers mixed so that you would get one average speaker embedding for this data set. And uh, then you fr freeze it and you, then you train again on like really low quality data. And during inference later, you just add this embedding from the high quality, the highest quality speaker embedding, and maybe it improves the quality. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Can you go back like to the training of the text to acoustic, to the semantics, to the yeah, text to, to semantic? Yeah. So, um, what I wanted to say all the time, like, um, yeah, it's so super pretty because you don't actually need any text data. You just need more or less clean audio data and you can do everything with whisper um so you only train this light blue model there and um i was wondering like i think you mentioned at some point in the discord server that whisper has some weak spots that, that it cannot read certain topics or certain kinds mm. of of contents yeah so you know, we don't really know what happens because, you know, we don't know how Whisper was trained. We can only guess. But there were people who discovered that Whispers likes to hallucinate, you know, please like and subscribe. So <laughs> it's highly likely that they trained on a lot of YouTube videos. And then because this hallucination is pretty embarrassing, they probably worked to remove it. So the Whisper is less likely, the model is less likely to generate this exact text that's overrepresented in the training data set. So uh, what I noticed happens, especially with the bigger Whisper models. So normally when you get a bigger Whisper model, the quality goes up and that's great. But the, oh, like it, 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 it has the sin of omission. So it, it will drop some parts of, of text consistently every time you try to run it. So what I noticed, for example, is that since every audiobook in the LibriVox collection starts, every chapter starts with, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. And I memorized it by heart by listening to it so many times. But the fun part is if you run this you know, short speech segment through Whisper, large, for example, or medium, it will output nothing. 
<laughs> it will pretend there's no speech there at all. When in fact, it's you know 30 seconds of somebody speaking. The, the good thing about this is that the whisper tiny model, despite being pretty bad at, you know, sometimes it mistranscribes uh, words or has troubles with numbers and, you know, other kinds of errors, makes other kinds of errors. But it's actually resilient to this, uh, you know, tricks where it tries to like drop some big parts of, of text altogether. So what I ended up doing is I actually transcribed it twice. And if the length of the transcription from tiny and you know big or uh, larger or medium model is very different, which it is a lot of the time where where whisper does this 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 tricky thing and lies lies to us a little bit, then I will just drop the sample. So this is a very easy way to actually improve the quality of automatic uh, transcriptions for the you know I could keep these samples of course, but then the model would you know, be forced to learn something stupid. So for example, forced to learn that it should speak, this is a LibreVox recording, every time there's no text, <laughs> because this is what will happen a lot of the time in this data set. So this is something you want to avoid, right? Like if you look, for example, at, you know, whatever, what, what's happening with Whisper, or if you look at the model that it's more similar to ours, I guess, which is the Bark model, which is also like a decoder-based text-to-speech system, they have this problem where sometimes you will just put in some prompts to speak and then it will generate, you know, twice the amount of text completely at random because it just, you know, it's, it, it, it keeps speaking even if it runs out of text to speech, text to, text to speak. So with a little bit care, more careful curation of the data, so I think you can avoid this problem uh, where the model starts to hallucinate something you don't want. And this is pretty important, I think, for you know, actual applications. So we, we've noticed this, that this happens to a lot of open source text-to-speech models. And I haven't actually seen this happen to whisper speech yet. Uh, it Sometimes, you know, it may make an error of cutting something short. This happens. I think it, it it's, it's just because these models are not, you know, big enough. And, you know, maybe I'm a little bit too eager to cut off the uh, semantic token stream at the first end of text token that I encounter. There are tricks to, 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 to fix that, but I never, this like it never actually synthesized something that was not there in the text, which is I think a nice thing if you wanna, you know, automatically generate a lot of speech, you don't want to just, to, you know, out of the blue start saying some things, especially if you train on the, on, the, on the content from the internet, right? Because otherwise you would have to spend a lot of resources on reinforcement learning from human feedback to avoid spitting nonsense, because there's a lot of nonsense on the internet. <laughs> I, I have to say my battery is going to run out uh, soon. Mm. Um, so far, this was a really awesome like conversation with you, and I like we can uh, stay in touch later. But like, do you have already some plans with Collabora to train bigger models? Yes, yes, um, we are currently training. So you know, I expected to to release this like two months ago, but it turns out that training big models is not as easy as you would believe from all these papers. Um, so unfortunately, all these papers I read omit important details on how you can actually successfully scale these models up. Um, and it's more tricky than it, uh, than it looks like. But we found this information. There's an, a very interesting paper from Microsoft and OpenAI that you know, basically walks you through how you should adjust the defaults that are used by PowerTorch and all the frameworks if you actually want to train a model from scratch to, on, a, on a big data set. And we were able to incorporate this into our, our code. And we are currently in the middle of training you know, bigger models. We want to scale them up at least 10 times. And I'm pretty sure this will, you know, judging from the, from the progression from very, very small models into the models we have right now, we should get a lot better quality and uh, a lot better speech out of these models. So we're going to release this really soon. I'm just waiting for you know, one model to train. It should finish tomorrow. Then it will probably take a week to train uh, an, an either bigger one. And if everything works all right, that we will have you know, a lot better quality uh, right now. And we are also, I think I can reveal that, we are also in talks with Lion to train something together and to use you know, exactly. a more varied data set. 
So we are for of this, course, we no. would need for, for this we would need um, like multi-node training code. I think you probably have this, right? Yes, so um, we have multi-node training. Uh, right now, fortunately, the models that were, I was able to train were you know trained on just eight GPUs. It was enough. Of course, for a lot bigger models, you need multi-node training, but yeah, the code is prepared for that. There will probably be some bugs, but you know, nothing that can be ironed out. Um, and we we yeah, we want to do this together with you guys. And of course, if you know somebody else wants to needs a good quality text-to-speech model, we are happy to help them as well. And you know, they can use our model, but if they need some assistance with that, we would be happy to provide that to them commercially as well. I mean, like, like speaking from Lion, from the open source community, if anyone is interested in contributing to the open source models, just feel free to come to our Discord server and um, reach out. So I think, uh, I, I think your business will probably be if you have commercial clients who need the support and like the, the full stack instead of just like getting a model running and on the home GPU. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like Columbra is pretty famous for open sourcing everything we can. So, you know, there are some clients who come to us and, you know, ask us for help and they say, oh, you cannot really release this as open source. This is our product. So we don't do that. But um, other than that, we are really happy to contribute to upstream and to make sure that, you know, the open source foundations of this civilization we build, we, we build our, you know, civilization upon are improving over time and they're just not somebody threw this model on over the fence and then left it there, right? We want this to keep improving. We want to keep building on top of it. And uh, that's, that's, that's in our culture and our mission to actually uh, promote open source and make sure this is, open source is the best choice for any kind of application you, want, you, you may want to uh, need to develop. These are great words for ending this video because I really, need to take care of my battery yeah. <laughs> thank you very much it was a ple pleasure to be here and uh, yeah. thank you, you very much bye bye bye